He joined the FC faculty in 1972, and he has taught chemistry and mathematics, and has served as registrar, dean of students, and from 1991 to 2009, as the vice president and academic dean, guiding the college through full accreditations of its first five bachelor degree programs. His faith has always been the greatest part of his life, and in 1993, he took a two-year leave of absence in order to preach the gospel in Romania after the fall of the Iron Curtain. And as a science and education, or mathematics educator, he has devoted much time and energy to the study and discussion of intelligent design and the issues around evolution. He has been invited to deliver numerous lectures on this topic at other college campuses and in other settings. He is active in civic associations at the Temple Terrace Chamber of Commerce and Tampa North Rotary Club, where he has served as president from 2002 and 3. Dr. Payne was born in 1945 in Beaumont, Texas. He and his wife, Marilyn, have been married for 55 years and reside in Temple Terrace. They have four children and 16 grandchildren. We are thrilled to have you here tonight with us. Thank you for coming. I'm going to step aside and we're going to ask Brother Jim Gershon to lead us in a word of prayer. After Brother Gershon finishes with the prayer, we'll ask our kids to break for their classes and after which Brother Payne will lead us in our discussion tonight. Brother Jim. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful to be here for this great opportunity that we have because we, as your children, live in this culture. And so many things are affecting us and so many freedoms are at risk. And there's so many existential threats that we see uh, to our faith, to our liberty, and even to challenge our minds and take away our freedom of speech. Father, we're in a challenging time where our faith needs to shine where we need to have answers that we can give and love, answers that we know and that we can trust in. Help us not to be people that withdraw from society because of society, but help us to be the salt of the earth, people that will stand for you and stand for the principles that you've given us as we live in this life. You've blessed us abundantly with physical things. You've blessed us abundantly with new life in Jesus Christ and forgiveness and a hope that we live in that someday we will see your face. We love you, Father, and we love what you have done for us. Help us each day to try to walk closer to you. We recognize our failings and we lay them before you and we're so thankful for your mercy. We appreciate Brother Payne and his dedication to you, to your word, and his desire to help us understand better this cultural conflict between science and, and those that are of faith. And we recognize that we have a position that is backed by evidence and not just by blind faith and help us to learn it and to be able to give it to others. And we look forward to his message tonight. Be with him as he delivers it to us. Bless this congregation that we, as we reach out to those that are struggling, as we come alongside them to show them better who Christ is and show them that he is the, the answer to life's problems. And he is the person that stands in our place and has given himself for us that we might be redeemed back to you, and one day we'll be with you all forever. Just bless us this night and help us to uh, meditate upon the things, pay attention closely, and may you be glorified in all that is done. Through Christ we pray. Amen. It's a genuine pleasure to be with you. I begin with Psalm chapter 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, you who has set your glory above the heavens. 
Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have ordained strength because of your enemy that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? But you have made him but a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, and given him dominion over the works of your hands, over all the sheep and the oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening to talk about the great God we serve. I'm going to be talking about him from a perspective that is not the normal sermon. We're going to look at God's other book. Because he has another book besides this one. I believe this one is his book, the Bible. And I love to speak from that as well. But tonight we're turning our attention to God's other book. The book of nature that speaks of him. And I'm happy to do that as well. So thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. My prayer this morning was that in some way, God may be glorified in what we do together tonight. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Christians in the 21st century are living with a profound reliance upon the products of science in our daily lives. Need I name them? Computers, electronic devices of other kinds, smartphones, robots, instant communication, instant access to everything. The omnipresent dominance of science in our world is illustrated beautifully in the pandemic we've all just been enduring, isn't it? Follow the science, they say. The question for this evening is, can science and Christianity coincide? And the answer on part of many is absolutely not. The new atheists are adamant that the more we learn from science, the less is the need for God. And God is simply the God of the gaps of knowledge and information. And when you have more knowledge and information, you need less God is the concept. In addition to that, new atheists are advancing the notion that what science has taught us speaks against the notion of God. And so people like Sam Hastings, Richard Dawkins, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and numerous others are almost evangelistic in their fervor for atheism. It is amazing to me why anybody would want to be evangelistic for atheism, but they are. Richard Dawkins wrote the book called The God Delusion in which he said, if this book works as I intend, religious readers will open it and will be atheists when they get done. God is a delusion, a psychotic delinquent invention of by mad deluded people. That's pretty sick. Faith, he said, is blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence, a process of non-thinking. So says Richard Dawkins. This combination of factors makes us in a world where Christians react differently to science, everything from admiration over the amazing advances that it has brought us, to the fear and distrust that science will overthrow our faith somehow. And especially I want to say to all the young people in this audience, I too went through a period in my life of being challenged in my faith with science. And here I stand 60 years later, and I'm telling you, do not be afraid of science. If you study it deeply, you will become more deeply believing in God. Because science and Christianity can coincide very well, thank you. So what do I do with one hour 
I do have an hour. And there's many directions to take. So I'm going to do my best tonight to get across some key points that I, I hope will stay with you. And it's being recorded so you can listen to it again. So I'm pleased with that. Science was invented, if you would allow me that way of saying it, by people who believed in God. And that's very clear from the history of science. As a subset of my work at Harvard, I sat at the feet of three of the best his historians of science in the world at that time. And that's a favorite topic of mine because there's much to be learned. Can Christianity and science coincide? I will tell you. I'm going to show you a picture in a moment of some people that are historian, that are in our history of science. Famous people. So let me lay the groundwork for you. What I'm going to present to you tonight is a story of how science has supported God amazingly well, how science turned against God, and how we now live in a century in which the science, if you interpret it properly, is a better support for God than ever. Did you hear that? That's the story I want to tell you and share part of that with you. So I'll back up now to the time when science was really being invented the way we understand science to work. And that was in the Renaissance after the Middle Ages. Basically, the 1500s through the 1700s. The luminary, there's a very famous one, Johann Kepler, 1571 to 1630. Johann Kepler, it would be worth your time to go study that gentleman's life. He was a fervent believer in God. And in the text that I have written for the book, there's some quotations. I'm going to share some of this with you. But here's what Kepler said, I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. Since we astronomers are the priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else to the glory of God. And so in the early 1800s, this gentleman, William Paley, wrote a book called Natural Theology, which was a required course for every college student in England. And I suspect in other places as well they had similar books. But the whole thrust, can you read the subtitle? On evidences of the existence and attributes of the deity collected from the appearances of nature. And so natural theology was a study of the existence of God as it appears from what you observe in nature. And he presented in this text the great argument from design which is the fundamental and I believe always the strongest argument from science for the existence of God. Well, that was a required work by William Paley in those days, and it certainly had a great influence on many. And it is founded upon a scriptural principle. So, I want you to turn with me to one passage of scripture. I quoted Psalm 8. Let's look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Certainly, this could be well described as a theme passage for this lesson. And while you're turning there, may I say to you that typically, when I do such a lecture as this in a science classroom on a college campus, I do not use this book at all. Because God has a testimony in his other book that is plenty sufficient and when you start quoting the Bible to folks who don't even believe in God, ladies and gentlemen, you turn them off, and they quit listening. So in my view, as a science teacher, I prefer to refer to the things they'll listen to about God's other book. But in a church building like this, I think it's proper to pro, uh, quote the Scripture, too. 
So Romans 1 says the following, For since the creation of the world, verse 20, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their own thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And that is precisely what began to happen between the 1700s and the 1900s as men completely changed their approach. And the argument from design became belittled because the notion was just because something looks like it's designed doesn't mean that it was. And nature itself has the capacity to do things that look like they were designed when they were not designed. Or as Richard Dawkins would say, all you observe is pitiful indifference. Nothing is designed. So Carl Sagan in his series Cosmos, the most popular television series ever made, took place in the 1980s, we're now some two centuries later, said this in his first lesson of that series, the cosmos is all that is, or was, or ever will be. And that's where men came after two more centuries. Instead of glorifying God, now we're glorifying the cosmos. And that's all there is. So I hope you get it, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, I'll just say this now lest I forget. I'll call you my class sometimes because this is a lecture. And you're my class. So if I say that, please forgive me. I mean, ladies and gentlemen. These gentlemen have reached the ultimate of saying nature can take care of everything. In other words, nature itself has become their God. Because it has the capacity to do whatever has been done. So Pierre Simon de Laplace, 1749 to 1827, kind of took over for Newton. He claims he's the French Newton, or some people did. His statement basically was this. Nature, with its matter, energy, and forces, could produce and maintain our solar system. There's no need for any God hypothesis. And it is said that Napoleon, who was his boss, asked him one time, you've written a five-volume book on the celestial heavens, and you don't mention anything about God. And his response is said to have been, I don't need such a hypothesis. So from Laplace and others, deep thinkers, great thinkers in a lot of ways, came the notion matter itself could produce what you see. You don't need God for that. Charles Lyell, 1797 to 1875, wrote the book Principles of Geology that greatly, geology that greatly influenced Charles Darwin. Because the whole thrust of the book was all the features you see on earth could be explained by the same kind of forces happening today over long periods of time. You don't need God for the geological features. You just need matter and energy and forces. And then came along Charles Darwin in the late 1800s, published his book, The Origin of Species, in 1859, in which if you can read the title of this book, It says, and I've got to get up closer to read it myself, preservation of favored races in the struggle for life by means of natural selection. And may I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that what came out of that treatise, which is, in my view, the most world-changing treatise other than the Bible that's ever been written, Because since 1859 to the present time, the worldview has come to be 
that you don't need God to produce living species either. Natural selection acting upon natural variation is sufficient to account for everything you see that's living. He didn't deal so much with the origin of life itself, but with all the kinds of living things. God didn't need to create all that, it, and nature itself did that. It was Darwin's basic thesis. So there's no need for a designer to account for the origin of the species of life. Natural selection acting on natural variation accounts for the appearance of design. The appearance of design. There is no design. Design requires a designer, doesn't it? And that's anathema to these folks. And Alexander O'Perrin and John B.S. Haldane in the early 1900s proposed a way to get life from non-life without God. And in the early 1950s, when I was just a youngster, things began unfolding to try to demonstrate that. There was a very famous experiment in 1953 called the Uri Miller experiment in which they took some basic chemicals, they hit them with electricity, let them run for 20 some odd days, and out came some of the basic building blocks of life. And they based the experiment on the apparent Haldane hypothesis, which basically said there's no need for God to produce life of non-living matter either. There was a different situation in the early earth. It was reducing instead of oxidizing, and you could have produced all the basic building blocks, and then life could get started by itself. And the Uri Miller experiment demonstrated it, they said. So I was going through junior high and high school in those days, and it was a heady time, ladies and gentlemen, because scientists were telling me, we're learning so much about what's going on about the natural world, you better get over this God stuff. Because we don't need it. But I'm here to tell you tonight that the argument from design needs to be revisited. Because we've learned a little bit in the last hundred years that folks didn't know between 1700 and the late 1900s. And so we need to listen to what we've learned. The evolutionary worldview, ladies and gentlemen, has won the day as for, as for now. The solar system has evolved by natural causes, they say, and has been eternally existent. Matter has always been here. Matter and energy are sufficient and the blind forces of physics to account for our universe. The geologic features of Earth have come about by natural causes. Living species originated by natural selection and natu acting on natural variation. Life itself could have originated by natural causes. While there's an appearance of design, in some instances, they can be easily explained away by natural causes. The materialistic worldview has become the world's paradigm. Don't you be fooled otherwise. And the result of it is, and this is not my lesson tonight, but I cannot leave without saying this. The result of it is what we're seeing around us with the utter decay of morality. On what basis, ladies and gentlemen, would you establish a moral system on the foundation of materialism? There is none. And I'm sorry that that's where we are. But my main thrust tonight is to tell you that in the last hundred years, we've learned an awful lot that speaks to the question, of, is there a God behind this? And I want to share just a little bit of that with you tonight. And if you like, you can bring me back later for a five-lesson series. 
because it deserves it. So, I'm going to use as the foundation of these comments here in the next few minutes a little book called God's Crime Scene by J. Warner Wallace. I like it very much because he writes as simply as he can about some heavy things. He's a cold case detective. You probably know what that is. That's somebody that's brought in to try to solve a murder case that's gotten cold. That's a difficult job. That's the kind of work he did, and he was an absolute avowed atheist. Wanted nothing to do with his spirituality business and God. Saw no need in it. And one point said it perfectly fine with him. When he's dead, he's dead all over, and he's over like Rover. So that's where he came from. He is now a fervent believer, and it's based on his investigating this question just like he would as a detective. So he's calling the universe God's crime scene and investigating it. I love it. So here's one of the diagrams in his book. He talks about eight different things. And let me get my good pointer here. The universe had a beginning. You see this little circle here? He speaks of it this way. When you go into a house and there's a dead body there, as a detective, you've got to ask yourself, how'd that dead body get there? And there's four answers to that question. Could have been an accident, right? He could have killed himself, suicide. Or it could have been murder. Or it could have been something else that happened by natural causes. Three of those he doesn't care anything about. Well, the one he cares about is the murder. Was there a murder? Well, how do you establish based on that which of those is the right one for this particular case? You look inside the room. And the question is, given all the evidence inside the room, can you explain the dead body without leaving the room? If so, it's probably one of those other three and not murder. But if the evidence adds up to somebody had to come in from the outside and tamper with this, then it's probably a murder. That's the general thing. So what's the evidence inside the room of the universe? Here's what he says. Based on what we know now in this century, the universe had a beginning. I'm going to talk about that briefly. The universe appears fine-tuned. You See that knob there? Life originated from non-life, so it says. Biological organisms display attributes of design. Evil and justice persist. Transcendent and objective moral truths exist. Humans possess free agency and consciousness exists. I'm not going to talk about these over here. I want to talk briefly about these three right here, or these four actually. And his question is, can you explain all those characteristics of the universe just from the inside? Nature's all there is? Or did somebody tamper with this? That's the question. I love that approach. So, what I'm going to do now is share with you a piece of chapter 2. So stay with me. All right, let me find it here. Where's chapter 2? Should have marked it. All right, class, you ready? Helen knew something was wrong when her daughter Carrie failed to answer the door. It was a bright summer afternoon. Carrie said she'd be home, and her car was parked in the driveway. Helen tried to peek in through the living room window, but the curtains were closed, unusually. Carrie never locked the back door, but when Helen walked into the backyard of the old house, she found the door locked and all the windows closed. Carrie wasn't like that. She usually left one of those badly worn rear windows slightly ajar. Not this time. Helen began to panic. She knew that Todd and Carrie had a tumultuous marriage, one that included physical violence. Todd had moved out 
But Helen still feared for her daughter's safety. You see, the couple had a child named Lexi, but the violence had only intensified since her birth. A week ago, Todd had threatened to kill Carrie, and just last night, Carrie confided there'd been yet another fight. All this was in Helen's mind. When Helen couldn't get Carrie to answer the door on this afternoon, she decided to call the police. This chapter starts with a murder case. Every chapter in the book starts with a case. And then he builds on that to examine the universe. We were compelled to examine the evidence of tampering because of one important fact. There were dead bodies on the crime scene and evidence that pointed to tampering. When we look out at nature, our universe, we need to investigate because there are living bodies. Where'd they come from? That's a humongous question. Like our murder scene, there are foundational, regional, and locational conditions demanding explanation. So listen to me quickly. I'm talking about Helen's case with Carrie, her daughter, and their, her granddaughter, Lexi. By the way, when the police got in, they found them dead on their beds. What was the evidence? Look with me. The foundational evidence was Carrie and Todd's relationship. It was terrible. And Todd's effort to restart the gas service, they found that out. That's background information, ladies and gentlemen, for the case. He says, as a detective, I always start there. Secondly, there are regional pieces of information. In this case, it was the car in the driveway, the drawn curtains, the locked door, the closed windows. None of that was normal. That spoke to tampering. That's not explained inside the room. Tampering. Third, there was locational evidence. That's down inside the house now. What did they find in there? They found a closed pocket door. They found clothing piled up against the bedroom door, and they found an unlit heater pilot. You think the ladies inside would have piled clothes up in front of their bedroom door outside of it and had the gas turned on with no lighter, uh, heated pilot light? Can you see the evidence is adding up for tampering in this case? And by the way, Todd was convicted of first-degree murder of his own wife and daughter based on the evidence. The universe itself appears fine-tuned. You remember that second thing I pointed out to you on his list? And that's the only one I'm going to talk to you about tonight because I don't have time to talk about the others. But let me just say this much. In the 18 and early 1900s, we were not convinced, scientists were not generally convinced that the universe had a beginning. Everybody thought it was eternal. Matter and energy has always been here. That was their answer, and it's just been rearranging itself and producing things. The evidence, ladies and gentlemen, is now overwhelming from the science that there was a beginning. They call it the Big Bang. They can call it whatever they want. I'm telling you, the science points to a beginning, and there's little argument anymore about that. Class. If there was a beginning, then there wasn't any matter and energy. That's a singularity, and matter and energy cannot be responsible for what's here. That only overthrows the whole thing. Secondly, we've learned the universe sure appears to be fine-tuned. Listen to this from chapter 2. Like our murder scene, there are foundational, regional, and locational conditions demanding explanation. The foundation laws of physics, the regional properties of our solar system, and the local conditions of our planet resulted in our existence. But this, did this have to be the case? If circumstances had been just slightly different in Carrie's house, 
she and her daughter wouldn't be dead. The conditions had to be just so for the outcome to be two dead bodies. In a similar way, ladies and gentlemen, if circumstances had been slightly different in our universe, there would be no living bodies at all. That's a fact. So let me, for just a few moments, examine with you some foundational, regional, and locational evidences that are found in the house. And then I'm going to ask you, which is more reasonable, that there was a designer behind this or that nature itself produced all these things? That's the question. Here's a quote from Paul Davies' book of 2008 called The Goldilocks Enigma. Why is the universe just right for life? Kids, you remember Goldilocks, right? She went out into the forest, and she found a house, and went inside. You remember? And she found on the table three big pots of porridge. And so she ate from one of them, and it was too hot. It's okay for you to answer my question. And she went to the next one, and it was... And then she went to the mid-sized pot, and it was just right. And she ate it all up. Then she went to the chairs, remember, same deal. And then she went to the bed, same deal. But she found certain ones that were just right. So that's what this is about. Why is the universe just right for life? Folks, if you were in a court of law today arguing this case, you would have nobody arguing against you because everybody knows what I'm about to tell you is exactly right. Nobody disagrees with this. One of the most significant facts, arguably the most significant fact about the universe is that we are a part of it. Where did we come from? Everyone agrees the universe looks as if it was designed for life. And you know what he goes on to say. He's an evolutionist. But it really wasn't designed. But my question to you, class, is how many coincidences does it take to convince you that wasn't a coincidence? It looks as if our universe is spectacularly fine-tuned for life. By this I mean only that it looks as if small changes in this universe's basic features would have made life's evolution impossible. Even the evolutionists are admitting that it sure looks like even evolution could not have happened. Because everything's so fine-tuned. So when I was in school in the 1960s, we had discovered two characteristics of the cosmos that seemed to be fine-tuned to make physical life possible. And there were some eight to ten characteristics of our solar system that were fine-tuned. We've learned a lot since then. By the 2000s, scientists had discovered 38 characteristics of the cosmos and over 150 characteristics of the solar system. I can direct you to a book where you can read all of those if you want to. But we know very well now there's at least 188 different features that all have to be fine-tuned for us to be here. I was trying to come up with a picture. I'm a terrible drawer. So can you just in your mind imagine? Imagine you found this guy who was a cosmic universe maker. And he built this machine that had all kinds of dials on it. Let's for now say 188 dials and, and you know, different levers and stuff. So here's this machine, 188 different levers. And in order to produce the universe that we live in, every one of those dials had to be set at precisely the right place. If you move this one right here, one t ninety bit to the right, you'd get no universe. If you move this one down here, lever up just a little bit, there would be no universe. Any one of them can be moved only a t bit. 
or you wouldn't have any universe. And everybody knows it. I'm going to give you one example. This too is from this book. He's trying to get you to picture the mag the magnanimity of this problem. Imagine covering the entire North American continent in dimes. Y'all know what a dime is still? It's a little thing about that big piece of a coin. And stacking them until they reach the moon. So you've got the whole North American continent covered with dimes stacked to the moon. Now imagine stacking just as many dimes again on another billion continents of the same size as North America. So you've got one billion and one continents the size of America was stacked to the moon with dimes. If you marked one of those dimes and hid it in the billions of piles you'd assembled, the odds of a blindfolded friend picking out the correct dime is approximately 1 in 10 to the 37th power which is the same level of precision required for the strong nuclear force. You change that dial 1 to the 10 to the 37th, 1 over 10 to the 37th, and you don't have any universe. That's just one of them. And can I explain the strong nuclear force to you? Probably not. But I'm telling you, the experts know that if it changed just that little bit, you wouldn't have any universe and much less life. So what are the foundational factors that support, fact, that support life that have to be just right? Well, there's a bunch of laws of nature. There are physical constants and ratios. There are properties of the elements and the properties of water. Look, ladies and gentlemen, there are a hundred and some out of those that all have to be just right on the dial to have life. Am I getting this across to you? How about water? You see, I'm a chemistry teacher. And if you were taking my chemistry class, we'd spend six weeks just on water. It's still the most studied substance on the face of the earth. Did you know how amazing and remarkable water is? And by the way, every form of life we know is based on carbon and water, right? There is no other form of life. People say in these books, life as we know it, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There is no other life that we know anything about. It's carbon-based with water. They're looking for life on Mars, are they not? What are they looking for? Water. It is an amazing substance. I ask the apology of every water molecule this evening for the M. It's just not sufficient what I'm about to say. I'm embarrassed. But I do want to tell you a little bit. It covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. They're trying to find a little T-90 evidence that it might have ever existed on Mars. We're covered up with it! You think that's by accident? Most plants and animals are more than 60% water by volume. So if your brother calls you waterhead, he's right. Water has a unique structure, ladies and gentlemen. If you were in my chemistry class, you'd learn this structure by heart. You don't just know that it's H2O. Everybody knows that, right? Here's what you got to know. It has a unique structure that gives it its amazing properties. It has a 104 and a half degree bond angle between the two hydrogens and the oxygen. This end of the oxygen then becomes slightly negative this end is slightly positive. It makes it a polar molecule, which gives it amazing properties, and there is no other substance even near it. <laughs> when I teach this to my kids in chemistry class, we look at stuff in the lab, and we go measure, for example, the specific heat. That's how much heat does it take to change the temperature of water, up or down. So you measure that. And then you take any other substance you want. I tell them, bring in anything you want, and we'll measure their specific heats. And everything's like this, like this, and then boom, there's water compared to everything else. You know why water is so important? It has the highest specific heat of any common substance by far. And if it didn't, ladies and gentlemen, you'd either freeze to death or burn up. 
you better be thankful your 60% water regulates your temperature. You want to have regulated temperature where it's between 60 and 90 degrees all year long? Come to my town in St. Pete, Florida, or Tampa. We're surrounded by water. It's hard to change the temperature of water. Now, you can believe all of those properties happen by accident if you like. I don't believe it for a second. You need to get on your knees and thank God for 104 and a half degrees. It has a uniquely high specific heat, a wide temperature range for liquid, less dense as a solid. Ladies and gentlemen, when is a liquid uh, having the solid float in it of the same stuff? That's not the way it's supposed to be. When you solidify, you get more dense and you drop down to the bottom, right? Not with water. With water, it solidifies into a thing that has spaces in it, and so it floats. Do you know you would be dead if that didn't happen? Because the properties of water are what keep you alive. Okay. Those are some of the foundational things that's inside the room. And the question is, how did all that stuff get so finely tuned so that it supports living things on earth? And by the way, we don't have any evidence there's any living thing anywhere else. Don't let them tell you we do. There's none. You've got to have the proper type of galaxy to have a solar system like we do. The Hubble telescopes discovered all kinds of fascinating things that we never knew before. Here's one picture of a constellation. And guys, could you dim the lights right quick for me? Can you see a little better now? Have you ever been out to the desert and looked at the sky? You see things you never saw. This is a portion of the constellation Serpus, Serpens, one little small part of the heavens. Look at all these things up here. You say, look at all those stars. Ladies and gentlemen, these big things that are like gleaming like that, those are not stars, those are galaxies with billions of stars inside of them. Billions and billions of galaxies. That's a fact. And there's a bunch of them right there. Okay, you can turn the lights back on now. I don't want anybody leaving me. The great majority of galaxies are elliptical, that kind of shape. There is no way, ladies and gentlemen, a solar system like ours could exist in an elliptical galaxy, and everybody knows it. Can't happen. There's too many gravitational forces pulling on everything. Won't happen. There are lots of irregular galaxies. But I'll tell you the kind of galaxy that supports a solar system like ours very well. That's this kind. It's called a spiral galaxy. And guess what we live in? A spiral galaxy. We call it the Milky Way. It's a spiral galaxy. Out of all the galaxies in the universe, you have to be in a spiral galaxy to have what we have. That eliminates the most of the universe. Why do you think people have begun writing in the last 20, 10 to 20 years books called Rare Earth? Whereas when I was in school in the 1960s, Cosmos and other, or, uh, Carl Sagan and others in those days, by the way, when I was at Harvard, he was at Yale, and he was spouting off about how many millions of civilizations there were in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, 50 years later, his same compatriots are saying there may not be another one like ours anywhere. And these are not Bible believers. No, sir. Everybody knows that most galaxies are eliminated as a place to support life. What about just the galaxy? It's not just being in a spiral galaxy. If, look, here's a spiral galaxy from the side. If, that, if our solar system were right in there, you wouldn't be here. You'd have been succumbed to gravitational electronic forces long since. 
No, the only place on the spiral galaxy that our solar system could survive is in a little tiny region here and here. And guess where our sun is? Right out there. But that eliminates, ladies and gentlemen, 95% of every spiral galaxy. So Carl Sagan will say, well, there's billions and billions of stars. We've already eliminated most of the billions of stars as possibilities. But it's got to be the right kind of star. It's not just good enough to have the right place in the galaxy. So here's our sun compared to our planets. You see our little old planets down here. There's a little earth. You can almost see it. But the sun's pretty good size compared to the earth. But what you probably don't know is, here's our sun compared to Sirius, the dog star, and Pollux and Arcturus. Not real big, would you agree? But that's not the end of the story. Here's, uh, <laughs> can't even see them. Here's Sirius, the dog star, Pollux, and Arcturus, and the sun is one pixel right down there. This is Betelgeuse and Antares. And then on the other end, there's a whole bunch of dwarf stars. Guess where our sun is? It's, say it with me. Just right. Between humongous and little tiny ones. Guess what it takes to support a living thing, a living system like that? Okay, that's another interesting coincidence class. I'm adding them up for you. And yeah, it's just a coincidence. You know what some people say? We're here, so it had to happen. We're here. Is that ridiculous? That doesn't mean you shouldn't try to explain how in the world we got here. The location of the planet is critically important. You can't just have the right kind of star. You've got to have planets, and they've got to be located in the right place. So here's ours. And let's see. We've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. What's that one? Nope, this is Mars. Venus is more close to us, and then Mercury and Pluto's back. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> How many of those count in the place where life could be? Everybody knows it's only those three right there. And by the way, Venus is out. You know why? Most of its atmosphere is sulfuric acid. Not real helpful. Plus, there's a bunch of other problems with Venus. Do you see anybody sending spaceships to Venus to discover life? They know good and well there's no life there. And Mars is not a real good candidate either. But do you see we've eliminated most of the planets? And by the way, they're looking for planets all over the place. It's hard to find planets way out 20 billion miles away, you know, but they're looking. Now let's talk about locational. We're getting down closer to home here. There's a bunch. And I, yeah, I know, my time is about up. I'm not going to go through all of these, but just look. The Earth has to have the proper mass, the proper spin, the proper tilt, the proper moon, the proper atmosphere, the proper crust. All within a very narrow range on those dials. Or you won't have life. The biochemicals, DNA, the proteins, etc., that's six lectures. The cells, the genetic code, the molecular machines, the biological chemistry, how is it that we can organize living things into categories? It's a good question. Ladies and gentlemen, there is enough foundational, regional, and locational evidence inside the room that there is no question where you should end up in your analysis as a detective. Somebody messed with this. There was external tampering. And may I say that in the best sense? Somebody designed this. This didn't just happen by natural causes. 
Are you kidding? You wouldn't believe that in any other realm of your life. And we have not touched the veritable hem of the garment. So, is it reasonable to believe in God in this scientific age? Can Christianity and science coexist? I love what Michael Behe says in his wonderful book, Darwin's Black Box, which, by the way, has an updated version, which you ought to get, because it's even better than the first one. Everywhere we look, from the macroscopic to the microscopic, things look like they are made. A loud, clear, piercing cry of design. And by the way, he put two exclamation points on it, so it's okay to yell. Everywhere you look, you see design. You have to force yourself to say, but that really wasn't design. Because it's everywhere. And the three lines of evidence that have overwhelmed. There's a beginning, there's a fine-tuning, and there's information in every living thing you can't explain without design. So I'm recommending this book to you. The Return of the God Hypothesis by Stephen Meyer. And he argues exactly what I've argued tonight. And it's a phenomenal book. I recommend it to you. An update of the mystery of life's origins. This was a life-changing book for me when I was in high school and early college days. It was the first book to challenge Ald Haldane and O'Paran's philosophy about how life originated from non-life and just tore it up. And now it's updated and it's worse than ever for the evolutionists. And here's an interesting little book by Michael Newton Keyes called Unbelievable, The History and Future of Science and Religion. It's well written. I'd recommend it to you. And of course, God's crime scene. Thank you for your careful attention, ladies and gentlemen. If you were in my chemistry class, I would give you an A. I didn't see a single person sleeping <laughs> or even kind of nodding off. So I appreciate it more than I can tell you. And this is not the normal kind of lesson, I get it. A little bit heavy. But folks, if I have touched you just a little bit to start investigating this massive evidence, it's like God has said to us, what else can I do to convince you in my other book? So is it reasonable to believe in God in this scientific age? I say it's more reasonable than it has ever been without this book. Because you have God's other book. And that's my lesson for tonight. Thank you. Buddy, we have an awesome God. Amen. He is real and he's alive. Thank you so much for the lesson and uh, taking the time to come out and uh, share this with us tonight. We appreciate it so much. It was really good getting to know you a little bit. Well, thank everyone that's here with us. Thank all of our guests. We have many. Several of you have been here almost every night. We really appreciate that. It's very encouraging to us. We welcome you back at any, any time that you uh, uh, desire to be here. Next week, we'll, be, we'll have Art Adams with us, and he'll be bringing us a lesson on the church as a healing place next Tuesday night. Will you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, and we're thankful for everything that you bless us with, Lord. We're thankful that we have this time set aside to come and to learn about your word and to listen to the lesson that's been prepared, Lord. We're especially thankful to, for the topic of these summer series, Lord. There, This world is throwing a lot of different and new and wrong things that are contrary to your word at us, Lord. And we need to learn to educate ourselves and be prepared to give a defense for you, Lord. We're thankful tonight for science, and we're thankful for everything that you've created. We're thankful for our bodies that you've created that work perfectly. We're thankful for the seasons. We're thankful for weather. We're thankful for all the beautiful nature that is around us is, and is attributed to you because you made it all and you spoke it into existence. Lord, we pray that you would be with us this night as we leave, that you would watch over our families. 
We pray that you would be with the two that were mentioned tonight, Donna Teeter and Joyce Hoffman, as they recover. And we also pray that you would be with Josie and the Armstrong family as they are about to bring a new family member into their existing family. Pray that you would watch over them and, and help her to have a, a smooth birth. Thank you for everything you do for us, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen.